morning, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in our Forward Malaysia series entitled The Way Forward, Medical Education and Hospital Training in the Post-COVID-19 Landscape. Proudly presented to you by Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia in collaboration with the College of Physicians and Malaysia Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society, supported by the Ministry of Health. My name is Premila Nair and I will be your host for this event. The Forward Malaysia series is aimed at tackling the pressing issues from the healthcare and medical education perspective and to discuss the way forward in mapping the future of the next generation of upcoming healthcare professionals. I do hope you are as excited as us to listen to our esteemed speakers who will be imparting their insights on this very exciting topic. Without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Acting CEO and Dean of Academic Affairs of Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia, Dr. Paul Hubbard, to give the opening speech. Dr. Hubbard, please. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, as, you, as Pamela says, my name is Dr. Paul Hubbard. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs and Acting CEO of NewMed. And I have the pleasure of opening the webinar today. So we at NewMed are excited to be able to host this free event today, following and building upon the success of the first Ford Malaysia event in February, and that was charting the way forward, path to the next normal. If you were unable to attend that first event, but would you be interested in viewing the talks and power discussion, then the recording is still available on the fordmalaysia.newcastle.edu.my mini site. As Pamela said, the purpose of these events is to provide opportunities for individuals throughout the healthcare sector in Malaysia to engage with and contribute to the shaping the future of medicine and medical training in Malaysia. Particularly, this is aimed at prospective medical students, current medical students and early career doctors. The theme of today's session is medical education and hospital training in the post-COVID landscape. We'll be exploring a number of topics including updates and changes to Malaysia's healthcare industry. Things a houseman shouldn't miss. We'll have a panel discussion with topics on the disruption of medical education. And we'll have a first masterclass talk after this webinar later on today. So medical education and training has been disrupted by the COVID pandemic as hospitals around the world have struggled to cope with increased numbers of patients. And this has highlighted the strengths and also the weaknesses of many healthcare systems across the globe. In this webinar, a number of these issues will be addressed and discussed. Firstly, we are privileged to have Dato Dr. Noor Azmi Ghazali, who is Deputy Minister of Health Malaysia. He is our keynote speaker, and he will do a talk titled Scaling Up Medical Education and Hospital Training for the 21st Century Physicians. This will cover updates and changes to Malaysia's healthcare industry and the medical education, as well as the Ministry of Health's future plans for healthcare resources in Malaysia. We're then proud to have Dr. Lechman, who will do a talk on things a houseman should not miss. This provides very important and useful advice for newly qualified doctors. Secondly, we will be having a panel discussion on medical education and hospital training. We have a number of key medical educators and experts in this field who will discuss this topic of medical education and hospital training in the post-COVID-19 landscape. On this panel, we have a number of experts in the field, and these will be very important to discuss many key topics. We will also have our first masterclass series after this session. These masterclasses will cover and discuss important and cutting-edge topics in many areas of clinical medicine. The first session is called Not All Seizures Are Epileptic. We're delighted to have Professor Datu Dr. Raymond Asmin Ali, who will do that talk for us. We will hope you safe, we hope, we'll hope you're able to stay for what will be an interesting and insightful talk later today. Now, as a neuroscientist myself, I'm particularly looking forward to hearing about the latest research in the field of epilepsy, but also to learn many new things relating to other possible causes of seizures. Finally, I'd like to thank everybody here for attending this event, and I hope you'll find today's webinar a valuable and enjoyable session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hubbard.
It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dato. Dr. Noor Azmi Ghazali, Deputy Minister of Health. Dato. Dr. Noor Azami, Azmi sorry, is a strong proponent of education and believes that there is no limit to what you can achieve through education. He has had an illustrious career ranging from that of a medical practitioner to the chairman of the Malaysian Highway Authority and finally to his current role as the Deputy Minister of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dato Dr. Noor Azmi, who will now deliver the keynote speech on scaling up medical education and hospital training for the 21st century physicians. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Duli yang teramat mulia, Tuanku Syed Faizuddin, Putra Ibni Tuanku Syed Sirajuddin Jamalul Lail, Royal Patron of Mimas, Datuk Syafiq bin Abdullah, Secretary General, Ministry of Health, Dr. Ahmad Razid bin Saleh, Director, Medical Development Division, Dr. Lechman G.R. Ramanadan, President, College of Physicians, Datuk Sri Dr. Paras Doshi, Vice President, College of Physicians, President Mimas, Professor Zabidi Azhar Muhammad Hussein, Pro Vice Chancellor International Medical University, Malaysian Medical Council member, Prof Chris Bolvin, CEO and Provost, Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. It gives me great pleasure as the Deputy Health Minister, Minister of Health Malaysia, to address you all at this webinar titled The Way Forward, which has jointly been organized by the College of Physicians Malaysia. Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia and MIMAS, a Malaysian Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society. The College of Physicians under the Academy of Medicine has always been strongly involved in academia and postgraduate education, as has been Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia for undergraduate medical education in Malaysia. The Ministry of Health has not won three roles, and all three are extremely critical. Firstly, we are tasked with delivering healthcare to a rapidly expanding population. It is not an easy feat as we have to ensure access to adequate healthcare services, not only in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas, while overcoming the disparity of infrastructure and logistics. Secondly, we are also tasked with the continuous education of our medical officers, both in the imparting theoretical knowledge and more importantly, in the form of the on-the-job training. Education worldwide is in a state of evolution from a pedagogical approach to an andragogical approach. Thirdly, we have to be one step ahead of the curve. We have to plan ahead for the health care resources that will be required for the country while utilizing the resources that are currently available to us today. Continuous education and assessments in all their forms are something that I'm no stranger to in my learning journey today. Until today, I have also been through similar trials and tribulations in reaching where I am today, and it was not an easy path either. One must not confuse learning with education. My degree in medicine from University of Malaya was a steep learning curve. It is for all students. Education provides you with a scaffold of a skeletal structure upon which you build your repository of knowledge and experiences. However, learning after you think you know it all is truly something that never stops. Till the time you draw your last breath, it is vital that our eyes remain open so that we see things as they unfold in front of our eyes. It is vital that our ears remain open so that we are able to listen to what is going on around us. And that we are perceptive of our surroundings so that we can analyze and learn from what is happening. In that way, the Ministry of Health is continuously evolving and learning from both our past experiences and also experiences from other nations in fogging our way ahead in these unpredictable times. One of the biggest challenges that the Ministry of Health has faced in recent times is undoubtedly the COVID-19 pandemic. Historically, 
the Ministry of Health has faced numerous challenges involving both communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. But few may compare to the COVID pandemic, both in its sheer magnitude and also speed in infecting the masses. As per the quote by Roger Crawford, being challenged in life is inevitable, being defeated is optional, but how we respond and learn from it is critical and in fact far more important. Helming the Health Ministry, which has one of the largest operational budgets of the country, has been nothing short of a challenging task. We not only have to ensure that services are maintained and continue to run, but we also have to continually anticipate future trends and plan of the future services. As a start, it is imperative for all medical students to take challenges in their stride as they progress through medical school. In fact, there may be even bigger challenges awaiting them once they step into the hospitals and the clinics. The clinical and non-clinical personnel need to be equally ready for the challenges that will come their way. Most important is how we rise to the challenge and improvise. COVID-19 is not the first pandemic to strike us, and it will definitely not be the last one for us. Hence, it is important for us to learn from this in preparation for the next pandemic. We have to continually learn from this pandemic. Every day, there's new information available on this virus. Every day, at the Ministry of Health, we have to adjust our strategy, not only in terms of clinical measures, but also non-clinical and administrative strategy. We must improvise continually. We may see the numbers going down, and the country may look like it is turning a corner, but at the Ministry of Health, we cannot let our guts down. We must not rest. Instead, we must take this as an opportunity to learn from what we have experienced to see what we could have done better. After all, hindsight is always 20 or 20 perfect vision. In the words of Albert Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If we follow the words of Einstein, we must learn to do things differently. It is very easy to fall into the rut of repeating the same action all the time, but it is hard to break free of the mold and think out of the box. Doing the same thing again will lead us back to square one. Thus, lateral thinking or thinking out of the box is an important concept that must be called upon. Only then we can truly break free of the shackles of the past mistakes and will otherwise come back to the haunt us. Just because doctors have an MBBS, that is not enough. Just because some may have the Master Medicine or MRCP qualification, does not mean that education is over. In fact, it is far from over. Learning on the ball applies to all of us in every position, from the clerical staff in a hospital, to the nurses and attendants, and of course doctors. We are always learning. Without this, we cannot improve for the future. We must break away from our silo mentality and engage with each other, capitalizing on each other's assets and covering each other's weaknesses will be the way forward. We must engage the private sector to look into taking over some of our services and facilities. This will free up manpower and resources within the ministry to better focus on the other critical areas. The ministry has moved in a new direction with the adoption of technology in our day-to-day -day management. This requires forward thinking, planning, education and staff, and of course, a steep learning curve in IT. The development of telemedicine moving forward will be another avenue that the ministry is looking into. Training our medical officers and specialists is another example. In an effort to meet the needs of Malaysian healthcare, the parallel pathway was set up. We have steadily learned along the way on how to plan and implement it. We revamped horseman training systems to address imbalances between supply and requirements, keeping in mind that the patient care should never be compromised. Subsequently, the parallel pathway systems were looked into. We learn from the mistakes of others and improvise where necessary. Development for formative assessments, coupled with a framework of summative assessments, has contributed to a pathway that 
is delivering specialists to meet the needs of the country. However, as always, it is a continuous evolution, a work in progress, and the momentum should always be preserved. The past year has been an eventful one, but many important events are on the horizon. We have vaccination now being rolled out, and our health care workers are prioritized in becoming vaccinated. You know, with steady adoption of the COVID-19 protocols and the SOP among staff, we should see a brief respite in the attack. We may not be able to have the big ward rounds like before. Students are not allowed to assess certain wards due to the infectious disease protocols. Teaching sessions may have not followed the schedule. Examinations have been on hold. Yes, there may be restrictions. But it should not let us continue doing what we have done before. It should not restrict us from treating patients to the best of our abilities. It should not stop us from teaching our junior. It should not stop us from learning how we can move forward with this pandemic. It's time to move away from the methods of the past. Utilization of small groups which minimizes the chances of infectious happening should be looked into. Usage of virtual teaching modalities should be maximized. Readjustment of teaching schedules should be explored. Education and learning should not be compromised. What is critical is the right attitude. The right attitude in wanting to find a solution to this problem. The right attitude in wanting to move forward with the new normals. Perhaps with adoption of virtual teaching rounds, student learning may ironically be better. I'm sure that they will be more engaged when compared to standing right at the back of a very big work round. In summary, the ministry will remain ever vigilant because we cannot let our guts down. But at the same time, hospitals must also take the lead along the educational institutions to chart the way ahead. We must learn and adapt up to the new normals. With this, I would like to leave you these parting words from John Wooden. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. A special mention goes out to our health minister, Dato Sri Dr. Adham bin Baba, for leading us through this pandemic. Job well done to the Secretary General of Health, Dato Shafiq bin Abdullah, for the successful planning and implementation of directives. And of course, to the Director General of the Ministry of Health, Tan Sri Dato Sri Dr. Norhisham Abdullah, and all the frontliners, keep up the good work and stay safe always. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Datuk Dr. Nur Azmi. I do hope you have found the speech truly engaging and informative and rightfully said it is time to move away from the methods of the past and look at how we should adopt new and advanced methods in the pursuit of academic as well as our career progression. Up next, we have Dr. Lechman Ramanathan GR who will be speaking on things a houseman should not miss. Dr. Lechman is a senior consultant physician and endocrinologist at Hospital Raja Permaisuri Bainun Perak. He is also the President of the College of Physicians and the National Head for Internal Medicine. Over to you, Dr. Lechman. Uh, thank you, Primera. Uh, I will share my slides. Uh, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd um, like to thank uh, for, you know, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to address to all of you. And the topic given to me was things a houseman should not miss. Um, I will be uh, discussing 
cases that actually happened that I was involved in or my team was involved in. Some had good outcomes, some not so good. But we are discussing them uh, <clears throat> because I want to share the lessons learned. Uh, and it's a mark of respect to these patients because um, we are uh, learning from them. And I think that's true. We always learn from our patients. As medical students now, uh, I understand most of you are in year four or year five. You may be anxious or you may be the cool cat, but if you are the one who's anxious, uh, <clears throat> these are some of the things that may be going through your mind. Would I get enough exposure for my training now in the current situation? Medicine is so wide, can I cope? Would I have a job eventually and would it be a contract and what does that mean to me? Can I survive husbandship? That's a big headache. And would I have postgraduate opportunities if I am on a contract job? So these are the questions that you, know, you, you may be faced with. My advice is take one day at a time. Everyone has such fears, only to a different degree in each one of us. Medicine is indeed white, but common things keep repeating. And so do the exam questions, they also repeat. So pay attention to past years. About getting a job, do not worry, you'll definitely have a job. Maybe there'll be some delay, but you will have a job because our population to doctor ratio is still high. So we need more doctors. And with regards to husbandship, this is the fact now. Most of your seniors and you know, consultants know that want you to succeed. It's in our, our interest that you succeed. Of course, in every place, there'll be one or two who will make life difficult for you. But those are one or two. The majority want you to succeed. Know that and go through it, this housemanship. Uh, even if it's difficult, just go through it. You will succeed in the end. If you need problem, ask for it, you will get it. And for postgraduate studies, uh, there are many pathways. There's just not one pathway, so you do not have to uh, have too much of concern about that. Finally, uh, I think to stay through all of this and to go on working as a doctor, develop a passion. And each one of us may have a different reason why we are passionate about medicine. For me, it has always been like this. Um, whenever I am on call at the emergency department and I see a new case and there's a problem, that's a mystery to me and I want to solve it. If I manage to solve it, and in the next few days, my initial diagnosis is correct, it gives me a form of euphoria. And I feel good, especially if the patient turns uh, better because of the therapy and it goes on with a smile. That itself is very gratifying. And that's what drives me daily. I'm lucky to say that I do not wake up in the morning on a Monday and say, Look, oh gosh, I need to go to work. Uh, so far, I've never had that and, and, and I consider myself lucky in that sense. Now, in medical school, you go through uh, many different subject matter. And you sometimes, and I wondered, even when I was doing biochemistry, I found it very difficult. I was wondering, why must I learn all of this? There's nothing clinical about it. But let me tell you that after graduating and seeing patients, every one of this has a reason why it's thought, because it forms the basis of you being able to do your work as a doctor. And I'll illustrate this in the cases that we see. And we have this very structured way of taking history, very structured way of, of, of uh, examining our patients. Again, there are very good reasons for it, basically not to miss out anything. And I'll also illustrate the cases that I've discussed. Now, how are we as doctors different from a psychologist or a pharmacist or staff nurse or medical assistants? They also learn to some extent diseases, pathology, physiology, and, and so on. Uh, but the difference is as doctors, we need to make the diagnosis. That's our responsibility. And you need to make the correct diagnosis because then after that, the subsequent management follows the diagnosis. And then we prescribe the drugs or the therapy that's needed. That's what 
sets us apart from the other healthcare workers. So be accountable for your responsibility, that is making your diagnosis. Once you've made your diagnosis, follow up with the patient and you need to see what happens to the patient. That's where you learn. You learn if you've made a mistake, you learn if you've got it right. So you remember your gut feeling at the time that you're making the diagnosis. What are the things that you need to pay attention to, what you may, should not miss? To be complete, always have this, uh, you know, when you make a diagnosis, always be confident on giving your reasons and write it down. And for every diagnosis, you need to consider the precipitating factors and the risk factors, and also the complications of the disease that you have in front of you. So a patient who has acute myocardial infarct may have the risk factors of being a smoker, family history, being positive, being having diabetes, hypertension, and so on but he may also now have acute pulmonary edema as a complication of his uh, acute myocardial infarct. So it has to be complete. And of course, do not forget all the other diseases that the patient may have. He may have COPD as well, and that must be written down. So be complete. Now I'll start with some of the cases I'll share with you. The underlying thing on all of these cases is never fail to ask why if something is not going along what you expect, or if the patient's presentation doesn't fit to your diagnosis exactly, always ask why. So I, I was doing one round in a uh, hospital uh, very long time ago, and then this was uh, almost 30 years ago. And at that time in that hospital, um, typhoid as a cause of fever was very common. So most cases are deemed to be typhoid uh, if they had you know, fever or prolonged fever until proven otherwise. So this patient who had came in fever was started on chronophonicol. And I saw the patient the next day. But by the time the next day, the patient was very well, the fever had come down. And I know from disease, uh, the way disease manifests and progress, when you treat with chronophonicol for typhoid, it takes a few days before which they respond. So because this patient responded within one day, I said, hey, it couldn't be typhoid. So I stopped the drug and went on to the next patient. The patient was well. But the next day, the patient was unwell again, high fever, and he had uh, you know, difficulty. He had some pruritis and, and, and so on. And then it started me thinking, how come within a day after stopping, the fever was back up again? And I remembered during my undergraduate days, my professor of medicine uh, once uh, showed me a case of scrub typhus and showed me showed us the class, the, the fever pattern. In the, such patients, when you give the right antibody in scrub typhus, be it uh, doxycycline or chronophonicol, the fever comes down drastically very fast. So I remembered that and thought whether this could be uh, scrub typhus, sent out the serology for scrub typhus, started him on doxycycline, and, re, and, and, and sure enough, the next day he was well, and the uh, serology came back as positive for scrub typhus. Scrub typhus is endemic throughout the country. It happens on and off all the time. It's something that you need to think about. And if you don't treat it, they can get all kinds of vesiculitis and have multi-organ involvement as well. So it must be one of the differentials for, um, uh, for fever. Okay. So, so again, you must know diseases. And that's why you learn diseases while you're in, uh, in medical school about how they progress. Next is a patient that I was, uh, came by to do a round somewhere in the midday. And I saw a patient who was supposed to have COPD, very drowsy, and they were going to intubate him. Then I noticed that he was on a nebulizer, which was oxygen driven. Then it hit me again, knowing about COPD. Or see a person who is dependent on hypoxia as the driver trigger for his respiratory uh, effort. So, um, so we took an ABG and at the same time took off the nebulizer. And within you know, 20, 30 minutes, he was alert again. And sure enough, the ABG came back. He had CO2 
uh, narcosis. So what was happening was because of the oxygen being given, it took away his hypoxic drive and he respiratory rate dropped and his CO2 climbed down. So just by knowing disease processes and seeing what is happening in front of you, observing, you could do a lot. And in this case, we saved uh, unnecessary intubation. Third case, a patient was admitted as per dengue because of fever and he was uh, observed, the fever came down. And I think it was on the 10th day or something, he was discharged. But at that time, the platelets were still 45,000, but he was discharged. But later he presented another hospital with bleeding and it turned out he actually had uh, ITP, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So, so this is something that you uh, must keep in mind that the thing that went wrong is knowing dengue that by day 10, the platelets would have come up much higher. And if you didn't in this patient, you need to think about uh, other uh, conditions. And most of these things uh, will be picked up by house officers because you are most intimate with the patient's details. So these are things you need to alert your team. You're part of the team. Don't be ever afraid to bring up something that you noted. It'll make a difference. So know the presentation and progress of diseases that you're treating. Learn it now so that you can use it later when you're working. Next case uh, was a lady that I remember very clearly to this day. Um, she, I was a medical student and she came in for in labor. But I noticed something unusual about her. She was in pain all the time, crying all the time. Other ladies who in labor, when they have the uterine contraction, they are in pain and then they scream. And once the pain is uh, over, they are more calm. But this lady was not. So I examined the abdomen, it seems slightly tender. And, and I looked for the fetal heart and I couldn't hear it. So uh, I, I made a diagnosis of uterine rupture. Look, I've never I mean, seen a patient with uterine rupture before, but I couldn't say that this is normal labor. Uh, so I wrote down a uterine uh, rupture. And at that time I was working in, as a house officer in university hospital. So I had to tell my, MO, the MO came and saw it and said, ah, you turn up, sure. then call the registrar. The registrar called the specialist. The specialist saw the case and then called the consultant and the consultant came. And he examined and said, look, obviously the fetus is not alive now and she's not progressing in a, in a uh, labor in, in delivery. So we will take her to OT to, for a caesarean section. And he told me, you come along. I don't think this is a uterine rupture, but we will see. So patient was taken to OT and, and as he made the first cut, the fetus was floating and, and sure enough, it was a uterine rupture. So don't be afraid to ever bring out something that's unusual in your patients. So you must know how patients present and query any unusual presentation. Never fail to ask why. Next is a patient uh, who does his exercise. He's about 40 years old. Uh, every day uh, cycling up a hill. And this time, on this particular day, he developed giddiness. So he came to the district hospital and he was seen. His BP was very high. They also did an ECG and that showed T wave immersion and some ST elevation in the anterior lids. So they thought whether this could be a myocardial infarct and asked the cardio trainee in another major hospital for an opinion. And it was said, okay, go ahead and give the septic, uh, thrombolytic therapy. But subsequently he collapsed and when they uh, did a CT scan later, he had a subcoronary hemorrhage. So what went wrong is was the ECG finding overwhelmed the way the patient presented. This patient had giddiness and his BP was high and he probably had subcoronary hemorrhage right from the start. And you know, in subcoronary hemorrhage, as a fact, you can have ECG changes. So pay attention to the chief complaint as well. That's why we have this separate thing called chief complaint and avoid over-reliance on investigations. Uh, this is 
a patient, again, when I was a house officer, I was called at 2 a.m. to see a patient in the oncology, uh, in the gynae oncology ward. And um, this uh, patient complained of headache. She said she had it over the last few days, was worse in the last few hours. So again, what I was thought, you know, you see a patient, you get the history, you examine, even though the patient already had a diagnosis of an oncology, uh, of, a, uh, of a cancer, but you still look for a cause for the new complaint. And I looked at the vital signs and the BP was very high. It was like 160 over uh, 100. And the pulse rate was only 50. And I was wondering why would this patient with this pain not have a tachycardia, but yet had a bradycardia. Then again, went on to do, because she has a headache, to do some neurological examination. And I found the, the pupils to be unequal. One side was dilated and not reactive, or was, uh, was poorly reactive. Then it hit me, could she have something going on in her brain, whether she had intracranial uh, hypertension for some reason or other. Then I called my MO, then called the specialist, and a CT scan was done. And sure enough, she had secondaries to her brain and she had hydrocephalus. So vital signs are vital and it gives you a lot of information. BP high, pulse rate high, there's different reasons. BP high, pulse rate low, there are different reasons. BP low, pulse rate low, there are yet other reasons like vasovagal and so on. So learn your vital signs uh, and always find a cause for the symptoms that the patient has currently in front of you. Next is a patient who is about 50, I think 56 years old. He came to a district hospital uh, complaining of chest pain and ECG was done and thought to have a acute myocardial infarct. And he was given a, a subtokinase. And after some time, he complained of back pain. So, um, but then he was transferred to the major hospital because, you know, he had thought to have an acute myocardial infarct. And in the uh, uh, major referral center, uh, again, he complained of uh, pain in the back, but he attributed to that to, you know, the way that he was transferred from the bed to the car, uh, to the trolley for transport. And, and uh, but he continued to have the pain. He mentioned that to the medical, the ED, the medical uh, officer on call. And even the next day, he mentioned it as well. But everyone is paying attention to the ECGs, the top Ts, and so on, and thought his backache was just uh, backache. Um, then he was transferred out of the main ward to a general ward. And in the night, he again complained to the house officer. But the house officer, what she did was, uh, she saw that it has, she has been complaining throughout. And, you know, seniors have seen, specialists have seen, cardiologists have seen. So she thought there's nothing more for her to add and did not do any particular action at that night. By, by next morning, he couldn't move his lower limbs. And when examination was done at that time, he had upgoing planta uh, and uh, then uh, there was a sensory level. Uh, MRI was done and there was bleeding in the spinal cord. So the problem here is what attention was not made to the new complaint and no examination was done because everyone is concentrating on the main main disease. Um, so always find the cause of symptoms. Here uh, was um, a, a patient was referred to me because of fits uh, that developed during pregnancy. And, you know, as usual, you need to get full history and examine the patient. And I noticed that the patient, this is not her photo, but she had this shortened uh, toe. And that, you know, made me thinking, you know, this is one of the uh, phenotype of uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. I thought whether she could have it and checked the calcium. And indeed, the calcium was low. In pseudo hypoparathyroidism, you know, uh, PTH uh, receptors don't respond to PTH. So the PTH is, is normal or even high, but they don't respond and hence the calcium is low. So in this patient, then we uh, not only, uh, we started her on calcium supplements and hence her fit was, her fits were then uh, controlled. So here, the importance of doing the physical examination and noting everything and trying to 
by the end. Uh, a patient, he's about 65 years old, came in with repeated episodes of syncope and in the emergency department, a CT scan was done, was normal. ECG was done, it was normal. Then he was admitted to the medical ward. In the medical ward, they carried on to organize a holter for him and also an echocardiogram for him. And then I came into the ward, this is my ward, and he was just about to be discharged. And as usual, I'll go through the, uh, all his other medical conditions and his drug history and so on. And I, uh, when going through the past medical history, he said that he, one of it, besides his diabetes and hypertension, one of it, he had a uh, uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy. And that was recently, like, so how many days ago, four or five days ago. And I asked, uh, you know, that was about the same time when he started having syncope and asked him whether he was on any drugs. He said he was given a drug. And even though he didn't have the drug with him, and later we got to know what it was, very often for BPH, you started an alpha blocker. And knowing a pharmacological days, you know alpha blocker is very well associated with partial uh, hypertension at the point of starting the drugs. And, and sure enough, he was an alpha blocker. And after we, we reduced the dose of the alpha blocker, his syncope was reduced. So that CT scan, the echo, the whole term, but probably not necessary if this history was obtained. So knowing drug history and other comorbidities are important. Next is a, another dramatic case, a patient with dengue and cephalitis. This was my patient who I'm treating for uh, pneumonia. And he was discharged on a Sunday afternoon. But on a Monday night, he came back to ED with fever again. And at that point in ED, he was diagnosed to have, because of the parameters, he was diagnosed to have dengue. And the next morning, uh, as I was doing my round, the ID team was also there, the ID trainee, and, and they were called because he has a diagnosis of dengue. But this patient was not, uh, his conscious level had dropped. Uh, his BP was now low. And, and uh, they thought that dengue, uh, ID trainee thought maybe this patient may have dengue encephalitis. So there I was examining him, touching him, and right in front of me, his pulse, which was palpable, was certainly not palpable. And then people started resuscitating him, giving him fluids. And then I went back to my own summary, and he had many conditions, other comorbidities, and one of it, he had minimal change bone arthritis for a long period of time, and he was on penicillin 10 milligram daily. And that was recently stopped because uh, the nephro team thought that you know, it is uh, a good enough a period, he had no more protein needed, it can be stopped. So then it hit me, could he have Edisonian crisis because now he's ill with dengue and he's under stress and by right, he should have more cortisol, but his adrenals are not able to produce because they had been suppressed by exogenous steroid for many years. So at that point in time, gave him a dose of IV hydrocort stat, 100 milligrams. And within 20 minutes, he was conscious again as BP picked up. So knowing past history, knowing the patient as a whole and making connections are important. This is very interesting. Uh, I was in a hospital called Kota Bulut as a first year MO. And my colleague, my fellow classmate was working with the army in a camp nearby. And he called me up one day and said, no, this patient, uh, and he says he's passing very long worms. How could that be? And I was also wondering because the longest worm that we know normally in our country is round worms and they're not feet, uh, meters long. Uh, and of course, hookworm, the other common one is very small. Um, so he said, okay, why not we admit him and see what's happening? So we, he was admitted to my ward and I told the nurse, whatever comes out in stools, please collect it. And I told the patient as well. Uh, please collect whatever comes out. So the next day when I went to the ward, the nurse proudly showed me a small specimen bottle with this white rectangular structures. I said, is this it? It's so short. So I asked the patient, why Why you said very long, this is so short? Then he said, no, memang panjang. It was really long, but it has been cut. So I asked the nurse, uh, why did you cut? So she, I remember her answering me, Still today, he said, tak muat, meaning what she said is the bottle was not enough, so she cut it off. I asked, where's the rest? She said, flushed it, flushed it down. 
So, so from the description, um, decided that it may be a tapeworm, even though tapeworm is supposed to be very rare in, in Malaysia overall. And later, by looking at the properties, we decided this patient, based on our pressology days under the microscope, we decided that it was tinea saginata. And sure enough, on I'm going through his history, he does take, for some ceremonial reasons, uh, uncooked uh, beef. So then we gave him a high dose of memendazole, and, and he got better. So that's why it's important to learn everything, peristology included. Um, this is a patient uh, in the ward who was admitted for dengue and the mother was taking care, but she noticed that he was vomiting in the night and uh, also he didn't look good overall. So she told the house officer, please call your specialist. My son is not well. My daughter was this way, like that. And, and, you know, please do something now. But again, the house officer, for whatever reason, was afraid to call his seniors. Maybe he has called too many times and uh, looked at the notes and many specialists seen before and said, thought there's the same disease process and didn't call. But subsequently, the patient really got worse and uh, mother had gone, you know, to the peat ward because she's used to the peat. The son is 15 years old. All the time was under peat for the inborn error of metabolism. Went to the peat ward, called them, and then they alerted us. Was taken to ICU and had a stormy uh, period after that. Uh, so what was happening was, yes, he had uh, dengue, but because he had in error, you know, in error, uh, 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 error of metabolism, he had a metabolic disease, which was worse because of the dengue. So he was very acidotic and very breathless. So the, the thing is, it's important to ask for help. Even though you're on a diet stress, you already asked many times, it doesn't matter. For your patient's sake, you need to ask people who are more senior, uh, do not ever. I always tell my doctors that if you can't get the MO, please call the specialist. If you can't get the specialist, please call your consultant. If you can't get the consultant, call your head of department. If you can't get the head of department, call the hospital director because you mustn't stop at asking for help for a patient in need. Uh, the reason I, I mentioned this category is because there's so much support available for you. Use it. This is another patient who was admitted as a case of acute gastroenteritis to a medical ward in a 28-year-old lady. But she looked very pale. And by the time they got the history of a period of amenorrhea and uh, decided to do a UPT to look for a topic, the patient had, had collapsed. So uh, remember one of the things that was taught to me last time. Um, if a young lady or child-bearing age comes with abdominal pain, Always consider uh, a topic pregnancy until proven otherwise. So this kind of pointers will always be given to you from time to time. Keep that in mind. So, so I think in ED itself, this should have been thought about and taken a very good history on, on a menstrual period, knowing that it's period of amenorrhea, uh, do a UPT or ultrasound to look for a topic pregnancy. Then the, the other patient, this patient died after a blood transition. And this happened because the house officer mislabeled. Uh, and, and I remember this case, uh, even though he was old in other comorbidities, but we thought it was due to blood transition. And the MO called me up and said, should we tell the family? And I said, no, you must tell the family. Because if they find out that you are ever hiding, hiding facts, later they'll never forgive you. And in this case, the two sons who came listened and they said, we will not take this further because you are honest with us, but make sure it never happens to another patient. So never take shortcuts eh, in protocols, especially for labeling, uh, not only for blood transfusion samples, but also for other things. Never take shortcuts, follow the protocol which you're taught. Uh, this I think is my last case that I want to share with y'all. Um, uh, this is a patient who came to my ward, it's a female ward, and he was look, uh, asking about his wife who was admitted for another condition. So he introduced himself and he shook, he shook hands. And I noticed his voice was a bit rough and his hands were dry. So even though he was asking questions about my, his wife, I was more interested in him. 
Uh, so I asked him, what does he work as? He was a karate instructor, but he added that he stopped working because he doesn't feel right. And he had seen many, uh, gone to many clinics and places and they've checked for diabetes, hypertension, that is blood works and told him that it's all all right. But you know, I thought maybe he could be hypothyroid. So I took off his blood and sent in the ward. And I remember this case very well because the lab called me up and asked, why is a male's patient blood coming from a female ward? But sure enough, later it came back as the TSH was very high, his T4 was very low, and he was definitely primary hypothyroid. And um, so, so we, started treated, we started treating him and within two months, he was very well. He thought I was great. But actually, this is something that has taught to me by my mentor, Prof. Khalid Kadeh. Always when you are around looking at people, note people, note things. So whenever I do run, what runs with him, even though we're moving from ward to ward, you look at somebody and, and say, hey, guy, do you think he has uh, acromegaly? Or another person who knows his ball, you think uh, whether he has mitonia dystrophica. So he, he had sort of made us always uh, look at people, observe. So be interested in people. So it's impossible to list everything not to be missed, but you know, as long as you're thorough, uh, you should be okay. Follow what you've been taught in medical school. Ask for help when something doesn't fit and be accountable for your patients. Follow up after you make the diagnosis, even if it's a few days, even in another ward, to know what happened. That's where you learn. So remember, your our res main responsibility is making the correct diagnosis and that after that, Thing follows. Getting the therapy is usually easy. Nowadays with the phone, you can get the options for therapy very easily. So try to get your diagnosis right the first time. But if it, don't hesitate to change it if you notice the patient is not responding as expected. And even if you sub-socialize later, do not let the detective in you to find out what's causing this patient. That go away. So thank you. I'll end here. Premila, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lechman. I'm sure future housemen attending this session would have found your talk engaging and informative. I know I did. Coming up next, the very exciting panel discussion entitled Medical Education and Hospital Training in the Post-COVID-19 Landscape at 9.55 a.m. Pamela, can I just test my microphone? Pamela, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Thank you for staying on. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused a widespread disruption to teaching and learning activities and medical schools are no exception. While there are many challenges for medical education in the COVID-19 pandemic era, there are opportunities which may change the future direction on how medical education can be further enhanced to address the need for a shift in the teaching and learning especially in clinical exposures in the hospitals. As students adapt during this pandemic, it will be important to understand to what extent the changes currently introduced in response to the COVID-19 impact medical education overall. Joining us today in providing their insights to how COVID-19 has disrupted medical education and the role of higher education institutions and hospitals in ensuring the continuity of future doctors' trainings are our esteemed panelists. First up, we have joining with joining us Dr. Ahmad Razid bin Saleh, Director, Medical Development Division, Ministry of Health. 
Dr. Razid's role involves overseeing the planning and implementation of Ministry of Health Hospital Services, coordination of the development and implementation of policies, including quality management, technologies assessment, and professional development. Dr. Ahmad Razid is also the National Public Health Consultant and former Director of Medical Practice Division. Our next panelist is someone who's no stranger. Uh, we've just heard from him, Dr. Lechman Ramanathan GR, President, College of Physician, National Head, Internal Med Medicine Services, Senior Consultant Physician and Endocrinologist at Hospital Raja Permaisuri Bainun Pera. We are also pleased to have with us Prof. Dr. Zabidi Azhar Mohamad Hussein, Pro Vice Chancellor Academic and Professor of Pediatrics at the Faculty of Medicine and Health, International Medical University. Prof. Dr. Zabidi is a council member of the Malaysian Medical Council and a member of the Malaysian Qualifications Agency Accreditation Panel for Malaysian and International Accreditation. Prof. Zabidi is also an alumni of Newcastle University. Yes, where we had graduated with an MBBS in 1985. Last but not least, can you join me in welcoming Datu Sri Dr. Paras Doshi, President, Malaysian Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society, Vice President, College of Physician. Datu Sri Paras is also the lead and national coordinator, Parallel Pathway Postgraduate Training, Internal Medicine Malaysia, and he is the acute medicine consultant at Hospital Tuanku Fauzia Perlis. The moderator for this panel discussion is our very own Dr. Paul Hubbard, Acting CEO and Dean of Academic Affairs, Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this session, you will be given an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. Please include your questions in the Q&A box and the speakers will try to address these questions. Over to you, Dr. Hubbard. Thank you, Pramila. Um, yes, I was, so I would also like to thank our panel for joining us this morning uh, and taking time out to discuss this medical education in the post-pandemic world. We've been sent a number of questions in advance, and these will be asked first. Each question will be directed to a specific member of the panel, uh, but then can be opened up for wider discussion. Uh, and as Pamela says, if anybody attending the webinar has questions, please ask them and add them to the chat. We'll try to set aside some time at the end of this session to answer those questions as well. So the first question is directed at Dr. Lechman. Dr. Lechman, as a passionate educator, there have been an unprecedented obstacle causing disruption in training. As such, training of housemen has taken a back seat. How has this affected houseman training? Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, I think it has affected differently in different hospitals and also in different disciplines. Uh, for example, uh, during the COVID era, there were probably less elective surgeries in the surgical disciplines. And uh, when I talked to housemen, they did, I mean, I asked them their feedback and they said, yes, they had less opportunities to see, uh, uh, to go to OT uh, and overall less cases. But on the other hand, in the medical wards, they were actually much busier because they were overwhelmed by uh, admissions uh, with COVID, even though they were not the first liners, um, because the other cases will then, they will have to be responsible because there'll be a good number of MOs will be taking care of COVID and the load will be a bit more of those who are not seeing COVID cases. And one houseman actually told me uh, during the periods where because of, you know, some exposure and their quarantine, their colleagues are quarantined, they had no time to breathe. It was uh, very, very, uh, hands on and, and they're working all the time and little time to sit down and reflect and learn. Um, uh, but with time we have uh, adapted and now we are allowing the more senior house officers once they are trained to also handle uh, uh, what we call severe acute respiratory uh, infection cases. So, so we have learned along the way and, and made uh, changes. So one of the things that um, I, I feel that it's important is there must be some flexibility in the houseman training, if it's possible, and Prof. Dr. Zabiti will probably be able to comment on this. Um, now we have this 
system of fixed four months and then they move. I'm just wondering whether it could be said the minimum is three months and once they can move on if they are okay in that particular discipline and the excess months that you have, they can go and do uh, the housemanship in areas that they are interested in or they feel they want more exposure. So that gives flexibility. And for example, last year, we could have actually put more people in medical and less people in surgical just for the reason there were more patients at that time in medical. So adult training and houseman training included involves actually taking care of patients. You've already learned the theory, but now you need to show that you are able to use the skills on patients in front of a supervisor. So I'm just wondering whether some flexibility if we had that would have solved uh, this problem that the house officers themselves uh, talked about. Thank you very much, Dr. Lesson, for some very good points. I'd like to open this up now to uh, anybody else in the panel would like to add anything to those comments. Uh, if I may? Yes, no problem. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I want to take the last point that uh, Lech mentioned yeah, about the issues of housemanship and, and, and the, the program for them. I notice now that um, currently we do have a, a minimum criteria and accreditation standards for, for undergraduates. We also do have the same, the same standards and criteria for postgraduates, but there is a gap in houseman. So currently we do not have a, a minimum criteria and a training scheme for, for housemanship. Okay, unlike the UK, uh, UK I think has a foundation program, which is a very very organized way of um, of uh, of of uh, training the housemanship. Uh, so I've now been appointed as uh, to chair the the houseman uh, subcommittee of the medical education of MMC, and our immediate task now is to do that is to use the, is to do just that, to create a minimum criteria minimum standard for the training of house houseman. Uh, akin to what we are doing in undergraduate and postgraduate. And I think with this minimum standard, we are sure that uh, because it will be recognized and it will be endorsed by the medical council, then the standard will be, will need to be followed by all the hospitals. And currently uh, we notice that through my engagement with the houseman, through town hall engagement with the houseman so far, each hospital seemingly doing its own thing. And I think if we have a common standard to be to be recognized, to be to be accredited, I think we'll have more uniformity. And I'm 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 always uh, being uh, guided by by the UK as I see UK Foundation program uh, run by the by by the by the Med um, General Medical Council of the UK. Yeah. So that that's my only uh, addition to that. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Professor Zabidi. I think what we'll do now is move on to the second question. And this second question is directed at Dr. Razid. So the question is, this pandemic would represent the perfect opportunity to take time out and think out of the box. From your extensive experience in public and private healthcare, how can we resolve private healthcare and private institutions? Or how can we involve private healthcare and private institutions in the teaching and training process and facilitate a synergistic relationship between them? What are the steps that are needed to be taken forward to move this process forward? Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Paul. Yeah. Uh, good morning to everyone. Yeah. Uh, thanks to New Med uh, Medicine uh, University for uh, organizing this and inviting uh, us uh, mini from the Ministry of Health to participate in the uh, forum section. Uh, <clears throat> well, we know that the uh, pandemic would have already uh, seen for the past one year has been affecting everyone actually. Uh, not only the Ministry of Health, but also the uh, private sectors as well. We know that uh, in the past, uh, the uh, private hospital has been always the service provider in that sense. Yeah? Uh, they have been regulated uh, way back uh, uh, under the Private Hospital Act 1971, and then under the Private Healthcare Facilities and Services Act 1998, uh, when the act has been enforced in 2006, uh, uh, upon which the regulations have been uh, passed at that time, uh, we know that uh, they have been um, they have been providing services in that sense. Yeah, 
Uh, in terms of the, uh, the training itself, uh, of course, um, uh, the act itself uh, is not restrictive in that sense, saying that uh, private hospitals uh, cannot become a training institution. No, there is no such provision, uh, provision in the act uh, which limits or restricts uh, such uh, um, situations. Yeah? For that, uh, however, even though they are allowed to, but they have to fulfill criteria. We know that private hospitals are being run by doctors, specialists, consultants, who are independent contractors, most of them. Uh, though they have uh, departments uh, comprising of several specialists, uh, but uh, in terms of the running of the facilities, each specialist uh, looks after a patient. Yeah? Uh, we know that uh, the act, uh, in a way, requires uh, some sort of uh, standards to be um, provided by these uh, hospitals, private hospitals, private institutions. But at the same time, um, uh, we want that continuity of care yeah? uh, to, be con to be provided uh, for safety of patient and quality. Yeah? Um, in, in the sense of uh, training, uh, we look at the criteria, among others, in terms of the case mix. Uh, what are the cases that are being uh, treated in the hospitals? Uh, how many numbers of specialists they have, resident specialists who are fully responsible for the patients? Uh, and the, um, if in terms of the requirements of the uh, uh, doctors to students' thresholds, yeah? that would uh, need to be fulfilled to a certain extent. Uh, these criteria uh, so far have not been uh, provided to the ministry, even though there were situations in the past, uh, proposals made uh, saying that uh, some of the hospitals uh, are, are interested to provide uh, houseman training uh, for the, uh, the houseman, of course, for, for the houseman. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, they do not fulfill those criteria. Yeah? Uh, so there are criteria in which they have to fulfill. Um, in the terms of the, um, if they, if they fu can fulfill those uh, requirements, of course, um, they can. They can, uh, 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 part of the accreditation processes uh, for trainings of the uh, housemen. And in fact, they are also allowed to have medical officers uh, to, to provide services in the wards as well, not only in the accident emergencies. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think I think that that's anything else that uh, that depends. I mean, the universities um, would like to have the medical student at the same time uh, training in the hospitals, but again, criteria have to be met as well. Yeah, uh, in that sense. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azid, for a very detailed and clear explanation. Um, again, I would just quite like to quickly open this up to the panel in case anybody else would like to add any thoughts to those comments. Dr. Lechman. Can I? Yes, yeah. Dr. Lechman, please uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, Azid, what he said, I just want to add to that. Uh, we in The MMC has come up with standards for training. Uh, and in that standards, um, as he rightly pointed out, there's nothing to say that a private institution cannot offer training uh, as long as they meet the standards. And the standards are very um, comprehensive. It has seven areas, in, includes governance and also what he mentioned, um, uh, uh, trainee-trainer ratios are important as well. But on top of it, we've had a new concept, which is... Uh, Patient, uh, no, trainee patient ratio. I think that's also important. You need to have enough patients for the trainees, and you cannot have too many trainees in one center. Then a problem arises. I think the universities has already been sensitive to this, and that's why they go to district hospitals to provide uh, uh, training for their house officers. But I think we shouldn't forget there are also uh, medical officers. Uh, uh, postgraduate subspecialty training happens in the bigger hospitals, and that's why the numbers get very big. And hence, we need to pay attention to this um, trainee, uh, sorry, uh, patient trainee ratios. We need to take into all those who are training there, because then it becomes very crowded. And we know now know that that's not the way forward. In fact, we should take training. My opinion, and I'd like the others to know, 
training to everywhere there where there's clinical care. That means all the district hospitals as well. As long as you have people to supervise. And now we know also the supervision can take in many, it can be physical. It can also be to some extent for some situations be online. So these are the way forward that we need to think about. But it's so important to spread it out training because we do on crowds. We, I think gone are the days where we are thinking about this grand round. And I don't think the grand round is very grand because the person at the end really wouldn't see anything. But on a video conference, you'll be able to equally see what's being uh, presented and spoken. And I, I believe where there's training going on, there's better clinical care. And where there's good clinical care, there's good training. So I, 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 I hope that we look to the future in, in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, very you, much, you very much, Dr. Letcherman. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. And the next question is for Professor Zabidi. So Professor Zabidi, a medical career is often described as being demanding and stressful. In some medical schools, training students to be resilient has been introduced to the curriculum. The COVID-19 pandemic and the uncertainty that this caused has further highlighted the need for medical students to be adaptable and resilient to change. Therefore, should resilience training become a core part of medical education? And if so, my, how might this be integrated into an already crowded curriculum? Yeah, that, that is a good question. That is a very good question. I think the future for medical education will be on, on psychology, training of psychology, training of resilience, and training of all these soft, the so-called soft uh, qualities needed for the medical student. And you mentioned about the crowded curriculum. I agree that uh, the, the, the curriculum currently is crowded, but I also feel that there are a lot of redundancies in the present curriculum. And the redundancies are, 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 should be revised. And I think for the future of medical education, I feel that there is a future for personalized learning in medical education with all the technology, with all the digitalization that we have, there is a real opportunity for the medical education to be personalized to individual, which means that even, even when someone someone can be exempted from taking exam if he's not ready to, to take the exam. And that's, that's, that's the, the extreme. You know, exam shouldn't happen at the same time. And it, it will be so personalized that um, uh, the, the student and the lecturer will be communicating digitally and he will only be assessed when he feels he's ready to be assessed. And I think with, with and this, can, this certainly can happen in my mind. It will be a personalized learning experience uh, specific to the student. And when that happens, when that happens, I think the entire curriculum could create more opportunities for training of resilience, more opportunities for incorporating psychology into the training and will end up with a better doctor. And also I think when the teaching uh, is so personalized, we can have more opportunities for experiential learning, I think, in my mind, which means that when, uh, when an earthquake happens in, in faraway places, for example, students can still follow the, the, the program in a personalized manner, but he will take that opportunity to go to the, where the earthquake happens and feel the sense of, 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 of the environment and be a better doctor, I think. So, but I think it's not going to happen any anytime soon because we have all the regulatory bodies, you know, looking at us and trying to make sure that, you know, we do as as being prescribed by MQA and MMC, MMC. But I think we can still do that. We can still fulfill the requirements of MQA of MMC through a personalized manner. That will be my extreme example of future of medical education. <laughs> Paul. Great, thank you very much for that. Yes, I think the iterations and long-term changes in medication is, is very important. Yeah. Okay, we've got a number of questions to get through, so I'll, I'll move on to the next question straight away. Um, and this question is directed at Datuk Seri. Uh, so the rapid change to the online and blended learning approaches to medical education has created a lot of challenges, but also opened up new opportunities. 
Whilst work-based clinical placement is still the gold standard for student experiential learning of clinical practice, with teaching approaches developed during the pandemic, sorry, which teaching approaches developed during the pandemic should be kept going forward? For example, can remote consultations replace face-to-face -face consultations in some situations as standard? Or should online sessions be replaced by uh, replacing didactic lectures? Thank you very much, Paul, for the great question. Um, I always believe that necessity is the mother of invention. So we have been thrust in an uncomfortable situation. Nobody wanted the pandemic, but it's here. And now it has given us an opportunity to relook at practices that we have deemed to be uh, you know, uh, unquestionable. We have been practicing medicine the same way for the past 15, 20, 30 years, and everyone says, oh, that was how it's done. It's worked fine. Look at us. We are very good. So it should work for you as well. And nobody saw the need to change this. But now with this pandemic, we have a great opportunity to address the system, look at it, see what's good, and move on from that. Uh, Work-based assessments, I think, are very good because they are now we're looking at assessments that are formative and summative. So formative is a way to guide housemen, give them input. Previously, it was a summative assessment, meaning if you're the poor house officer and you don't do well in that assessment, that's it, you're gone. You go home depressed, you're going to know that you're gonna be extended and there's a lot of pressure to perform. So we've got very good performers who can perform when showing someone, but they don't do it unconsciously. So we want house officers who are safe house officers who can do it without being observed. So that's where work-based assessments have come in. We are seeing them at the workplace. Education, MBBS, is not enough. You must be able to perform, which is patient care. So with work-based assessments, we are actually seeing, can they perform? Can they deliver patient care? And now with this work-based assessments with the pandemic, uh, it is a great time because now we have remote consultations. We can actually do it virtually. All right, and this is the time probably to use technology. We can use Google Forms, we can do online assessments. Uh, now examinations don't need to be 20, 30 housemen in one room doing an exam. Uh, they can do it online. And of course, now we have videos to teach house officers with work-based assessments. So all these changes that have come in have probably come in at a very good time. Uh, for example, uh, online teaching, I think that is the way forward. I think Dr. Lechman will have a good experience at Ipoh Hospital. All the housemen, doctors, they're all in their separate rooms. Nobody's in the same ward, but yet you're delivering online teaching. And I'm sure cameras have to be switched on. Uh, online teaching, there is a problem. Of course, we don't know whether the guy is engaged. He's smiling, maybe he's nodding at you, but is he switched on? So if the camera is on, I think that's half the battle won. The second thing is probably uh, using Zoom rooms, breaking them up into breakup sessions, encouraging discussion. There's so much that tech has to offer. And if we use this and embrace it, I believe this is a good time to take advantage, revamp our system and be ready for the next pandemic so that education can continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Datuk Seri. Um, Dr. Letchman, did you want to respond to that, some of those comments that were made in that as well, please? I, I would agree. I think uh, we, we can go a long way in um, in, in uh, adapting to the new norms. Um, so even if a, a te teaching session, like for example, I take uh, medical students in uh, HRPP, what I do is I, I fix a time and I usually start at 6.45 because that's when the ward is not so crowded. And the students come, they present the case and that's done outside the ward in an open area. Um, and then after the uh, presentation, then we... Uh, I take um, half of the students in, not more than five, to show the clinical signs, come out, and then show the next half five. Then we all come out in an open space. We are all spaced out. And Ipo Hospital is very good because it's the way it's built. There's windows on both sides, even in the walkways. And so we are there then discussing. So we can adapt very easily to the new norms. And uh, uh, at one time, I also had the case presentation online and then to see the patient we went to the ward so it's all possible thank you okay excellent thank you very much okay we'll move on to the next question oh sorry that took sorry in certain hospitals now they have virtual ward rounds so uh we need the specialist is sitting in a different hospital and they are seeing patients in another hospital and that has allowed training to occur in previously remote hospitals like kapit 
people would think you go to Kapit and you just serve your time. And I've God forbid if a husband is sent to Kapit, he thinks you're not going to the end of the world. Dr. Lech has gone to Kota Buluk. All right. Uh, previously, the, we used to think that was the end of the world. Now we think the Allah Datu is the end of the world. I mean, so basically with virtual technology, you can be sitting in an urban hospital, but you're supervising trainees in a smaller hospital and you're doing virtual ward rounds. Um, so education has, you know, turned its head. Uh, we are 180 degrees and uh, we should take this moving forward. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next question is directed to uh, Dr. Letcherman, but also Dr. Razid as well. I'll start with Dr. Letcherman. Many hospitals may want to wait and see, take a wait and see approach and prefer to see COVID settle almost completely before agreeing to take on medical students for training. The problem is that COVID is probably going to be around until at least 2022 or even 2023, if variants are going to make a, a bit of a comeback and, and, and cause extra waves. Have you got any thoughts on that? The, the medical profession, right, from ages, centuries, I mean, ages ago, has always been faced with infectious diseases. It's nothing new. It's an occupational hazard. And uh, we need to embrace that. And hence, everyone, right from the house officer, to the consultant needs to know about infection control practices and embrace it as something that we do on a regular basis. So I, I don't think uh, medical education, I mean, training should take a back seat just because we have a, a epidemic now. Uh, I mean, we've, we've gone through many, e even when I was in Kota Bullet for one year, I had a cholera outbreak. And within a few months, I had a hepatitis A outbreak. And so we had to deal with it. Uh, in now, we, we had, uh, first we had, the, in Ipo, we had the Nipah uh, encephalitis uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic, I mean, uh, and then followed by, uh, all of us went through SARS, then there's a MERS co, then there's the H1N1, and now the COVID. So this will keep happening. I think after the SARS, the world should have changed. The healthcare should have changed, knowing that this is going to happen uh, from time to time. And we need to plan our hospital structure, the pathway of admissions happening. Um, and um, we need to now make sure that no crowding takes place. I like the way the clinics happens now because of this virtual clinic. The clinics, my clinics are no longer crowded. So we have changed, we've adapted and patients are, are not uh, complaining. So, um, I, I, uh, another one is in the same line, I think training should be taken everywhere. Um, so I think we train, what you mentioned that it has taken a back seat. We need to learn from it and no longer make it a back seat in the future, even if there are any pandemics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Vazid. With response to what Dr. Latch uh, mentioned, it, it's true in a way, yeah. Uh, we know that um, uh, since uh, last year, February, uh, the whole country had been hit yeah, by COVID-19. Uh, uh, we know that the need for the students or the trainees to undergo clinical training for that. Yeah? And uh, from the ministry's point of view, uh, we have to balance out uh, with regards to the uh, one service delivery patients. We have to take care of patients. And on the other hand, in terms of training, there are students that are trained, have been trained in our hospitals. There are housemen in, in most of the hospitals, except where there are no, it's not being gadgeted for them. And at the same time, uh, we have to provide all this based on guidelines. Yeah? There are guidelines being established to, to make sure that things are in order uh, in the sense that um, reference are being made to the uh, state health department Higher Education Institute. There are, there are letters being issued out together with the guidelines and circulars, yeah? uh, namely the letter from the DG at that time, guidelines for the implementation of training for higher education students uh, <clears throat> issued April, 2020. Uh, then uh, guidelines on the implementation of hospital services post uh, movement control order, uh, training and research strategy and planning. Uh, integrated guidelines on the implementation of training of higher education students and trainees 
um, issued June 2020. Then uh, the uh, uh, standard operating procedures and implementation of training uh, higher education students and trainees. Uh, at the same time, DGs also recommend that the agencies need to follow the uh, updates on the government agencies as well. You know, the National Security Council on the standard operating procedures during the MCOs and uh, subsequently the CMCOs and so on. The uh, Ministry of Higher Education on the uh, recommendation yeah, uh, uh, and the latest instructions of, to manage uh, uh, students and trainees in their respective um, uh, institutions or hospitals and the state governments with regards to the movement of the in and out of the say for example students or, or personnel from Sabah and Sarawak coming back uh, to uh, Semenanjung yeah and also from here to going back to uh, Sabah and Sarawak to, to, to get into the uh, schools and so on to start the uh, classes and so on. Uh, <clears throat> with that um, of course uh, um, we, we have to balance out. We have to make sure that uh, thing has to go on. Uh, provide uh, the services has still to be provided continuously. At the same time, looking after the uh, training part of the medical students, housemen, MOs need to be trained to become specialists. Specialists then need to be trained to, to go for a sub specialty and so on. Yeah? Uh, it has to be balanced out. Uh, what has been uh, mentioned earlier uh, with regards to the, um, the houseman training. Uh, um, there are guidelines being issued out, uh, as uh, Prof Zabidi mentioned out, that uh, MMC also coming out with the criteria and so on. Ministry has it issued out in, uh, in April 2020 uh, in terms of how the houseman should function in, in COVID uh, situations, in COVID hospitals in which they are being uh, mobilized uh, to the uh, hybrid hospitals. Uh, there are no houseman training in the uh, COVID hospitals, as we know, uh, because of the situation in COVID, uh, full, fully COVID hospitals. Uh, the, the training of the houseman in the uh, uh, hybrid hospitals, which has uh, partly COVID and non-COVID, and also non-COVID hospitals. Yeah? Uh, there are guidelines to that with regards to the governance, with regards to uh, what they can do uh, and at the same time, it's in terms of uh, the uh, supervision by the uh, their supervisors, the specialists, and so on. Yeah, right. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Razid. Okay, moving on to the next question. This one's directed at Professor Zabidi. So, with the amount of disruption in medical training caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, those students will graduate having met the requirements of the medical school and their accrediting bodies overall clinical experience and exposure may be reduced compared to their predecessors. Should this be considered in the housemanship training with extra help and guidance provided to ensure those graduates are fully supported? Yeah, I think so. Um, although currently the MMC has recognized that um, with a minimum of 30% clinical exposure for final year medical students, they can graduate. But I think it will not be the same. It will not be the same as their predecessors, you see. So I, I think that um, we need to identify this group of, of housemen, this group of medical students, the COVID group, if you like, the COVID graduates, if you like. We need to identify them and, and really uh, uh, provide, uh, be prepared to provide additional uh, competency training once they enter the housemanship period, you see. I'm quite uh, attracted by, um, during our academic council meeting of the International Medical University last week, apparently, apparently, some universities in Scotland has actually taken the decision to defer the final year medical students. And they say that these final years should have an added year after the, uh, um, so it become a six year program and they stop taking the first year into the, into the medical school. And I think maybe that can be considered as an extreme measure, but I think I can understand the, the concerns that uh, clearly the pandemic has disrupted the training. The pandemic has uh, perhaps made them a little more uh, uh, deficient in their competencies. And that's what the decision that they had, they had taken to continue and into the sixth year. But I think uh, we need not go into that. We need not go into that. I think even with the, the pandemic, there are 
ways that we can do to compensate for the loss of skills. One is the additional competency training after in, during the housemanship period. Uh, and there are other things that we can do as well. Uh, um, there are so many other innovative things that we can do. For example, for example, um, we can convert our campus into a mini ward, into a simulation ward, for example. Uh, I can say that IMU did it. Um, we, during the pandemic, we immediately converted our campus in, in Seremban uh, and turn that into, into a ward and bring in patients, either simulated patient, patient with signs and symptoms. And doing that will ensure that the training continues because uh, we are not allowed to use the hospitals. So we converted that into, into a mini ward. So I think there are things that we can do. Uh, what we have also been doing is that uh, we created a, repos a depo repository. Yeah? I think that's the right word. Uh, we give, uh, 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 we identify patients who are willing to be interviewed at home and give them a, a digital pack, okay? And with that digital pack, with the access to teams and so on, we can, the students can still interview the, 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 the patients even in their, in their own homes and so on. So I think there are things that we can do uh, to try to minimize the disruption in the training program. Yeah, Paul, over to you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zabidi. Okay, this, this next question is, is directed to Dr. Razid, but I think you probably answered this in your first question. So if you have any updates, please, please add. If not, that's fine. So the question is about what are your views on private facilities being allowed to train house officers in view of the long waiting time for training spot in general hospitals? Are they ready to shoulder the burden of training young doctors? Well, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the, uh, in terms of the training of the uh, in, in um, <clears throat> private institution, private hospitals, basically, uh, they have to fulfill the criteria. Yeah, uh, in terms of the um, uh, what they need to do uh, to fulfill the uh, criteria, uh, besides um, <clears throat> providing such facilities, which is con conducive in terms of training, uh, the others are in terms of the uh, patients' uh, case mix. Uh, the ratio of patients uh, to, uh, as uh, Dr. Latch has added on early on, uh, in terms of the number of patients to the uh, trainees, in terms of the supervisions uh, of the um, uh, trainers to trainees, in terms of the number of uh, uh, lecturers to the students, yeah, uh, <clears throat> that has to be fulfilled. Uh, again, um, uh, we do we allow, and in fact, we encourage if such, uh, such hospitals can fulfill uh, the uh, requirements, uh, why not? Uh, it will complement the ministry in terms of uh, providing such uh, trainings yeah, in terms of the housemen. Uh, um, besides uh, the um, <clears throat> housemen in the Ministry of Health, we also know that um, the uh, army hospitals do provide such trainings, even though uh, they are not uh, fully concentrated uh, or integrated in one particular hospital, the training has been carried out in several hospitals uh, because of the numbers of patients, the numbers of specialists or consultants that need to supervise uh, the housemen. Yeah? Uh, it's allowable in that sense. Yeah? Right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Razid. Okay, so we're moving into the sort of last 20 minutes or so, last 15 to 20 minutes or so. So to give us time to have a few questions at the end, we've got a couple more questions we want to get through fairly quickly and then we'll have try to have 10 minutes q and at the end. So the question eight was directed at Dr. Lech is about how postgraduate training has been affected as a result of COVID. Uh, I will talk, um, well, with regards to um, speciality, that means the basic discipline, for example, uh, uh, for masters in medicine and surgery, that was going on in the universities. Uh, it didn't end. And uh, they adapted as well as uh, they also had the exams. So that went on. But in the parallel pathway, we couldn't have the exams uh, the last one year. So, um, so there are many, many candidates who have finished their training but do not have an exam to sit. So, uh, so we are trying to embark on having the exams soon in again following SOPs uh, in various hospitals which are willing to do it. 
one of the reasons the exams were not uh, held was because the hospitals themselves who traditionally organized this were overwhelmed by COVID. So we are now looking at new hospitals who are relatively okay to take on the exams, again, with the standard uh, operating procedures, protocols, safety put in place, which was done for the master's exams and also by the uh, federation when they organize the exams in their own places. And some of these exams, we uh, parts of it are now done virtually, like the uh, history taking and, uh, and so on. And uh, that, that is done virtually. So we are reducing the contact time to uh, physical contact time to make it safer. So, and if I go on to the postgraduate subspecialty training, there was, uh, I think, a three month delay last year uh, uniformly. Uh, so uh, everyone had stopped. Uh, but again, I feel in future, we need to find ways to make sure that this delay doesn't happen because wherever you are, even if you don't move, you can, you will still have the patients who will fall into the subspecialty and training and you should take care of the patients and have supervision virtually. I think this can go on. So yes, there was some delay in postgraduate uh, because of the COVID, uh, but we are learning from it. We are overcoming it now. Um, and in future, we need to have steps that it is pandemic proof so that the training carries on safely. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lecherman. Okay, so this next question is for is Director Datuk Seri. As the leader national coordinator of a parallel pathway postgraduate training, what has the effect been on postgraduate specialty examinations, both local and foreign? Well, um, the parallel pathway is for all the specialties basically represents one of the major ways of delivering specialists. So the local universities are doing their part with their local MED program. Their parallel pathways are generating specialists faster as well to meet the needs of the country. So right now the parallel pathway probably generates equal if not more specialists. And these general specialists are the ones who we need greatly to deliver healthcare in the remote areas as well. General surgeons, general pediatricians, general physicians, uh, they are the bedrock. And of course, from this, we will then get our subspecialists for training. So as the Dr. Lesh correctly mentioned, the exams were disrupted last year, but it's good. We had a disruption. We will see a hiccup coming in the next one year because we won't have general physicians, general surgeons, you know, the, because the parallel pathways have been disrupted. So, but this has given us an opportunity to move everything online. The MRCP Ireland has moved the exams completely online, the part one and the part two. The UK exams have moved the station two and station four also virtual online. So it means that we are embracing the new norms. And I believe for examinations to occur, the MMED was done successfully in October last year. So if we had the MMED, instead of holding it in one center, we decentralized it all the other centers. If you have exams running in smaller hospitals, you will motivate doctors to also progress because they think that, oh, training can only happen if you're in the Klang Valley. Training can only happen if you're in a good hospital like HKL or Penang. That's not true. And I'm sure Dr. Lech also and uh, Dr. Ahmad Razid also agree that it's in the smaller hospitals that you actually learn the most because you will see a patient from admission. You have to clap the patient. You will see the patient every day until the patient is discharged. And then you will see the same patient at follow-up. You see the entire continuum. Whereas if you're in a big hospital, you only see the patient once in your life and when you're clucking. And then after that, the patient goes to another ward. You don't know what happened to them. You're not being trained in the right way. So in smaller hospitals, training would probably be better than a main major hospital, contrary to perception. And um, so if, if we can do big things in the country with SOPs, why can't we do simple examinations with SOPs? No, there's nothing to fear. Is this coronavirus? We have our face masks, we have our face shields. Everyone's being vaccinated right now. What more do we need? We, 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 don't need, we, are, we are already prepared. So let's take, think, let's take the bull by the horns start examining again, roll out our assessments again. Uh, and now with these changes, I believe if we can travel overseas, if we can do search, is dangerous. And what is with the face mask? Fear, all right, there's nothing to fear. Move with it, 
have the SOPs in place. And I believe that postgraduate examinations can run as well as what they were doing. And now, because we have a, <clears throat> a shortage coming up, as Dr. Lech mentioned, ramp it up all over the country. Uh, can I can I, and I add on to that? Uh, I do agree with that, Dr. Sri, and also Dr. Lech. Uh, first, uh, in terms of the training itself, uh, everyone is affected, yeah? The postgraduate training. Ministries, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, I'm sure Dr. Lech would agree that uh, we are worried in terms of the numbers of, of the specialists uh, that uh, can be uh, trained and uh, graduate, uh, yeah, because there will be a gap in which, uh, in terms of number of specialists to be uh, gazetted and, and become consultants later on to provide uh, services in the Ministry of Health, especially. Uh, uh, we know that uh, 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 steps have, be to, have to be taken uh, to, to uh, counter all these uh, uh, situations in future. Uh, in terms of what uh, Dr. Sri has mentioned, the training can be carried out in a smaller setup. Yeah? Uh, but of course, uh, during this pandemic, we know that the number of patients also uh, are reduced in, in the uh, facilities. Uh, there are not that many patients uh, that have been admitted. The elective cases have been uh, postponed, uh, things like that. Uh, but of course, uh, training has to go on uh, to a certain extent. In terms of the parallel pathway, we do allow. We, we, I'm sure we, we do allow that, uh, but to a, to a certain limit. But in terms of the master's program, it has been delayed. Uh, but um, uh, even though uh, um, that, that has been um, uh, becoming two batches in one setting, yeah, uh, that has been passed out uh, recently. And of course, uh, the, um, the other administrative issues now that comes in in terms of the uh, Chuti Blaja, you know, the approval of the sort of, that have been sorted out by the ministry, of course. Uh, ministry, in, in the other hand, on the other hand, will try to facilitate. Uh, we support in terms of the training, uh, whatever the possible measures or the feasible uh, mechanism that have been carried out. Of course, the ministry will, will help out and facilitate in, in all those uh, situations, right? Okay, very good. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Razid, for those comments. Okay, so we're moving into the last 10 minutes now. So we'll have our closing question, which is directed at Dr. Razid, and then we'll open up for Q&A from the uh, audience. So Dr. Razid, as Director of Development, what are your five take-home points that we can act upon immediately? What would your advice be to hospital directors and state directors? And is there any middle ground in which we can move forward? <clears throat> Well, of course, we know that the roles of the uh, uh, state health directors, the role of the uh, hospital directors, uh, basically in terms of from the ministry point of view, we have to provide services to the people or to the community or the population at large uh, to ensure that uh, the service uh, can be accessible uh, uh, to the uh, people, to the patients. Uh, and in terms of the state health directors, they have to work together with other ministry or the other agencies within the state itself to ensure that the uh, facilities or the uh, healthcare services have been provided uh, in a safe way. Uh, similarly, for the, for the uh, hospital directors then, besides providing services uh, to ensure that the uh, uh, services in terms of the specialty has been provided uh, uh, properly and appropriately, uh, they also to have to look into the training part, medical students, uh, the house officers, uh, the housemanship uh, training, uh, the medical officers and the specialist specialty training as well. Uh, <clears throat> that goes on as, as in terms of the uh, how to balance it out. Of course, they have to make sure that the guidelines are in place. Uh, SOPs has to be uh, complied with uh, strictly. Uh, because otherwise, I'm sure we know that uh, there are reports in terms of outbreaks among the healthcare workers. It happens uh, in, iso in isolation uh, cases and on and off here and there. But, uh, but if we have taken um, uh, measures uh, to, to uh, counter all those uh, outbreaks and in terms of the, uh, to make sure that uh, it will not spread further. Yeah? Uh, these are the things that have been carried out uh, by the ministry. Uh, in terms of the um, preparedness and in terms of the uh, uh, handling uh, such situations. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of the uh, 
preparation uh, when the uh, medical students, we know that as uh, Prof uh, mentioned just now in terms, of course, uh, the, the institution, the universities, as far as possible, try uh, to make sure that the training is complete. Uh, we have been uh, listening that um, the medical students requires uh, exposures in terms of whether theory, theoretical or in terms of practical part of it, uh, in terms of uh, looking after patients, seeing patients. Uh, but as they can, uh, as when they graduate, uh, the ministry also has this, uh, what we call the clinical attachment program for those uh, graduates, medical graduates that are awaiting for placement, houseman placement. Uh, of course, there is no uh, monetary allowance for that, but uh, they can go for such an attachment for six months period uh, to hospitals uh, in which they can, uh, they can have a feel in terms of uh, applying what they have learned uh, with regards to the knowledge and uh, seeing what the doctors uh, are doing. No doubt they are not been registered. They have, no, they have not get their um, uh, uh, temporary registration uh, by MMC. Uh, but of course, uh, they, are, they are not allowed to do uh, procedures, but they can, they can clock patients. They can continue and examine patients, of course, under supervision by the medical officers and so on. Uh, these are the programs that have been opened up so that uh, when the time comes for them to, to uh, be posted as a houseman, they are more prepared in that sense. Yeah? Uh, at the end of that six months, in fact, if they don't, if they don't uh, complete that six months, it's, okay, it's still allowable, it's up to them. Uh, it's, it's between six months, uh, 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 in, within six months. Uh, they'll be given uh, some kind of certificate that have already attended such uh, clinical attachment program for the pre-houseman uh, placement. Yeah. That, that's the ministry has been carrying, out, carrying it out, actually. Of course, uh, the, the hospitals that are being allowed to, uh, those are the, some of the minor uh, specialist hospitals or the district hospitals, but not the hospital that has houseman's uh, training. Uh, hospital that had been uh, gazetted or, or to provide houseman training so, uh, so that you will not mix up in terms of what uh, they can do uh, to, to interfere what the housemen are doing actually. Yeah. <clears throat> thank, thank you. We encourage the medical graduates uh, to, um, uh, to, to, <clears throat> to join uh, such a program so that they will be more prepared. Yeah? Uh, we, we know that during the medical student they may have been affected but with such program, they may be well uh, exposed further uh, before they join in uh, to do the um, uh, houseman. And in fact, they can also uh, view the uh, logbook, what uh, the houseman has to do, the 16 uh, competency, uh, the core competency uh, topics in which uh, they have been assessed throughout the housemanship. Uh, they are all there uh, during this period and they can uh, um, uh, do uh, the uh, training for them. Yeah, and of course there is no uh, assessment. Uh, it will, they, they did not to worry that um, uh, in terms of assessment, it will not affect their their houseman training later on. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Azid. We do have a couple of questions come through, but I think with four minutes remaining, we'll just ask one one question uh, in the Q and A, and open it up to the whole panel, and that is. What can be done to enhance pandemic preparedness? How can we pandemic proof our medical training going forward? So I'll open that up to the entire panel. Maybe uh, I'll go first and then uh, others can join in as well. Um, I, I think there are already things underway in the Ministry of Health to look at our the structure of our new hospitals and also modifying our present hospitals to. Uh, ensure that future pandemics will not cause clusters within hospitals. So that's going on. And I think that has to be done in all healthcare centers, the way clinics as well, how patients come in with respiratory symptoms in particular, that has to be planned and it has to be in. Uh, number two, I think everyone, every healthcare worker needs to know about infection control, right from medical students, uh, student nurses, right to the consultants. And that um, cannot uh, be compromised in any way. And then we need to, to reduce crowding in a particular place. I think we have mentioned this uh, several times today. We need to take uh, training 
uh, everywhere so that if you know when there's a cluster outbreak in one hospital it doesn't affect so many people at the same time if you spread it out so uh, to do that we need to pay attention to this uh, 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 patient trainee uh, ratios as well uh, and ensure that we have people who can train uh, throughout the country and not in certain areas uh, thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Letcherman. Any more final comments before we complete? First, Can I, I say a word, uh, Paul? Um, basically, I think pandemic preparedness should be an integral part of medical training for medical students. I think we should we should not uh, 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 forget that uh, for, you know, for for the future. The the training of medical students should include how to prepare them for for pandemic because uh, as we see now. Even though we allow medical students to be in the ward, uh, parents will object and say, that, oh, you're exposing my, my child to the uh, possibility of infection and so on. So I think, I think we should prepare the parents, we should prepare the, the medical students to face that. And I think we should convince them that with the face masks, with the face shields, with distancing, with vaccination, they should be able to undergo this without any problems. You know? So uh, sometimes students are okay. Students are all right with the training, but we face a lot of pressure from parents. I mean, that, that is something that we need to deal with as well. Yeah. yeah. I'll just add to that as what Prof. Zabidi said, we'll always face pressure from parents uh, yeah. who think that we are you know, torturing their children. Uh, yeah. But it's very important to realize that safety with face masks, everything is all right. And I just like to take this opportunity to stress that in hospitals, because of the pandemic, many of the senior clinicians, the professors, the lecturers, they were busy with the patients. And when they were busy, it's assumed that training stops. You can't teach. Learned in medical education. The best teachers, the housemen, are the junior medical officers who are just ahead of the curve. Social learning says that you learn best from the people who are just ahead of the curve from you. You do not need the esteemed professors who have less hair on their heads or who have pot bellies or who are in their 60s and 70s to teach you medicine. All right. It is that junior medical officer who just is four months ahead of you and he is going to be the best teacher for you. And if you have this sort of learning transfers happening on the ward, training is continuing. Education is continuing. And that is what we need to take care of. Because in Asia, we always believe the fatter you are, the older you are, the less hair you have, the better the teacher you are. All right. And that's not true. All right, the, for experiential learning, it's the person who's just ahead of the curve who will teach you how to do an ABG or how to get a shortcut and you know, get a venipuncture done without traumatizing the patient. And that's what we need. And parents need to understand that as well, that if the professors are not there teaching, the junior medical officers are equally good teachers in their experiential learning. That means that training is continuing, all right? And it hasn't stopped. Right. Uh, um... In, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that that's what uh, we, we have been uh, facing all these while, yeah? even in the ministry. Uh, parents comes and then uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> asking about a lot of things with regard to their, uh, um, their children and so on. I'm sure in, in, in every uh, difficulty that we face, there will be opportunities. In, even in there, if there are changes that we need to do uh, in certain kind of uncertainties, there will be opportunities as well. Yeah, I'm sure uh, moving forward uh, in future, we have to address in terms of the pandemic, it will stay on, it will not be completed, even though we know that the vaccine uh, has been coming. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but at the same time, we have to be prepared. Uh, Ministry of Health, at the same time, we have in terms of the clustering of hospitals, in terms of the teaching, in terms of mobilizing of the uh, trainees yeah? uh, and, and the supervision. Uh, but at the same time, uh, certain aspects uh, that we need to look at in terms of the way how uh, training to be carried out has been discussed. Uh, new, new ways of uh, uh, things uh, need to be done. Uh, of course, that requires commitment from the supervisors, the uh, lecturers, and also the commitment, especially from the student themselves or from the houseman in terms of houseman training. Uh, they need to they need to 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 adopt to such uh, changes and situation in which uh, of course we uh, as the pioneers uh, have been in the, in the healthcare system would want certain kind of standards to be still maintained and improved from time to time 
Right. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. So I will bring this uh, session to a close now. Um, I would like to thank all of our participants um, for a very interesting and enlightening discussion. Um, we are truly honoured and impressed by your efforts to spend time with us today and to shed light on this very important topic that affects all of us here today. Um, Dr. Azid, as, as Director of Development, you would also be the person who will be able to guide us on how the Ministry of Health under your watch is taking steps to address the issues discussed today. So thank you very much everyone for taking part. I'd like to close the session now. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent, excellent session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our first session. Up next is the very first masterclass uh, entitled Not All Seizures Are Epileptic by Professor Drato Dr. Raymond Azman Ali. Professor Dr. Dr. Raymond is a senior consultant neurologist at the medical faculty of UITM. He is currently the chairman of the Epilepsy Council of Malaysia and the current chairman of the Neuro Neurology Subcommittee of the National Specialist Registry. Please refer to your email for the Zoom link. And if you are facing any technical issues, please contact us at WhatsApp number 016-667-8245.